Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner where we answer your questions. On this week's show, fighting aging. Training through or tapering for races. Standing all day at work. Swim squad or public lanes. And how to deal with open water anxiety. Remember, we'll answer your own questions. Leave them below this video or any other one. Use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. Next week, we can be answering your triathlon related questions. So straight into our questions and SATX76 says, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. My question at 77, the elderly shuffle, shorter strides, lower cadence is catching up. Are there drills and exercises that might enable me to slow that closing rate? Wow, Four. at 77. That's good going. Yeah, keep fighting the good yeah. fight. Yeah, <laughs> like to hear it. Unfortunately, the reality is age is going to catch up with all of us, uh, especially if you're 77. Um, there's not much you can do about that, but you can slow down the process. You will lose muscle mass. Mm. You will lose bounce. You will start to shuffle more. But you can fight that process. You can slow it down. Um, the best way to do this or the the biggest concern is muscle loss. Essentially, when you're in your 20s, if you go to the gym and you pump weights, you're gonna put on muscle, you're gonna put on weight, and that's gonna be kind of detrimental to your endurance performance. When you're in your 70s, no matter how many weights you pump and no matter how many how high intensity reps you do, you will not put on muscle mass that slows you down on endurance. You will, however, slow down the breakdown of that muscle. Mm. And that's kind of what you want to do. So you kind of need to shift your, your strength work from endurance-based strength work when you're younger, where you're doing multiple reps of low weight, to more power-based strength work where you actually are actively trying to build muscle. You won't actually build muscle, but you will slow the muscle wasting. You will slow the loss of muscle. And that's really what we're gonna look for as you get older and older into those older age yeah. groups. And, and also, as you've probably found, uh, your flexibility also suffers as you get older. So trying to work on a little bit of that flexibility to combat that shuffle uh, will actually help. Yeah, actually running won't ever push your range of motion mm. so much that you're actually pushing that, that, that flexibility and that range of motion. So you're just kind of, fall well within the, your, yeah. your range of motion. So you need to really push that out by doing yoga, Pilates, something else. As with anything, when you start yoga, Pilates, strength work in the gym, whatever it might be, start slowly and build up gradually. Yeah, we were actually talking about it because I was like, well, would Pilates work for someone of this age? Because you kind of lose that spring. But as we were sort of discussing, actually, Pilates, uh, sorry, um, plyometrics. Uh, plyometrics. Plyometrics, there they, they can be a lot of impact in that. Uh, so actually probably that's something you would want to avoid. Um, yeah. So and, and that is the case for a lot of this. Just be really careful with whatever you introduce because, yeah. Yeah, you. slow and steady. Don't want to risk injuries. <laughs> right, next one from Adam Delman, 2896. Uh, in the past, I focused on 70.3 racing, but qualified for age group nationals, and I have an Olympic distance nationals in mid-September. I have three Olympic and sprint races every other weekend from mid-June to mid-July. Then I have a sprint in mid-August and Olympic two weeks before nationals. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Okay, uh, my question is, how do I train through or taper for these races? Sometimes when I go hard in a race, I have no choice choice but to recover after my legs are sore intensity is impossible should I consider not going that hard in some races my typical training is two weeks on one week recover about 60% volume blah, blah, goes on um, yeah interesting one this is a this is definitely a scheduling question yeah. and also actually for those thinking well he's only doing sprint Olympic distance races talking from experience here a longer distance races do really tire you and there's kind of this real deep fatigue that you get from that but you quite often can find you bounce back and you're on your bike and running around quite quickly but actually from some of these short distance races you're quite right you can feel really really sore for a few days after and actually you find you can't actually go running for a few days after so there's definitely a different kind of recovery that is needed for these short distance races yeah. but what is important and uh, looking at your schedule with a million and one races, <laughs> you need to figure out which are your A races. You can only really peak during a season two to maybe three times. So you need to start figuring out which are your A, your B, your C races and really focusing on which ones are going to be that A performance. Yeah, and having a maximum of maybe two, three at an absolute push, A races. Now an A race, you taper well for it you recover well after it. A B race, you can build in some recovery into your training program afterwards, but you kind of need to train right up to it. And a C race, 
you're training right through it. You're not, you're not training right up to the day and you're straight back into training the next day. Now, a little bit of this is you choosing your pace and not pushing too hard in those C races because it's a C race. Uh, but a lot of this actually takes care of itself because it's a C race and you haven't put much pressure on yourself and you not really have, don't really have high expectations because you haven't tapered or anything. You just won't push so hard. You won't dig so deep. You won't put yourself in such a hole because you don't actually have that many expectations and therefore you'll be able to train through it. Whereas an A race, because you've tapered everything else, you are willing to absolutely leave it all out there on race day and therefore the next day you might not be able to walk. But that's okay because it's your A race. So you really do need to take a good long look at your season and put an A or a B or a C next to each of those races and then build up to those races and recover from them accordingly because you can't do it for nine races in a season. Also, it does beg the question, do you need to be doing all those C races? Why are you entered for them? Uh, I mean, if it's just for the case of, you love triathlon and you want to do them, absolutely go for it. Uh, but if you're just doing it for the sake of it, um, you might actually benefit more from not doing it and just training through at home. It, these are things they to are weigh okay. up. Races are yeah, good yeah, training. Oh, However, not if it's going to cost you on your A race. Yeah. So a C race is great training, but only if it doesn't cost you on your A race down the road. So make sure you're building that in and you're, you're, you're planning uh, all the way through. Okay, next question. It's from Dawson Futter. Hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. I have got a job where I spend a lot of my time on my feet. I'm wondering if this is good or bad for my running training. On one hand, I get used to spending a long time on my feet, but on the other hand, my body does not recover as efficiently from, and I, so I cannot train as much. Please tell me, should I quit my job and quit start job. working in an office? Well, absolutely, yeah. Quit your, quit your job and be a professional runner. No, uh, okay. Standing all day is definitely not ideal for your run training. I mean, uh, the ideal for your run training is to be running or lying down and nothing in between. Obviously, some of the elites might almost be able to pull that off. No one else can. But that is kind of the continuum you're working on here. If you're standing all day, you're definitely not recovering as well. Uh, and so if you are looking to absolutely maximize your run performance, you should definitely quit your job. Okay, no, you can't quit your job, but you can build this into your training a little bit. You can compensate for the fact that you're gonna be on your feet all day. Uh, one of the ways you do this is to do your high intensity stuff where you do wanna be, be flexible and you do wanna have some spring in your legs before your work shift. So get up early and do it before you do your work shift, stand all day. Don't do it at the end of a long, hard day on your feet because you just won't have that bounce and you will actually be increasing the chances of injury. Similarly, don't do your long run where you are going to be really tired afterwards before you're gonna spend all day standing. Do that on a weekend where you can actually put your feet up afterwards for a little while. Um, those kind of things you need to build in. And then also just be cognizant of the fact that you are going to be a bit more tired uh, and spread out those high intensity efforts and those long efforts a little bit more than someone who was sitting in an office all day might necessarily have to do. Yeah, and the other thing really is to look after yourself because unlike someone that is sitting on their backside in an office and resting their legs between these sessions, you aren't really getting that recovery in. So you're rushed off your feet and then you're going straight out and doing another run session, make sure you are giving yourself time to kind of look after your lower limbs, your feet, uh, make sure you're wearing the correct shoes, make sure everything's nice and loosened out um, because yeah, you, this could quickly kind of catch up on you. Definitely, yeah. Okay, Matt J. Han asks, GTN Coaches Corner, too long, didn't read. In swimming, is it better to do a race distance specific session but execute it suboptimally or do a session that's less specific but executed perfectly? Okay, T-S-D-U. Too short, didn't understand. Let's read the rest of it. Context, where I live, there aren't many public swim sessions I can get to, and the ones that I can get to are really busy. I end up being unable to execute an optimal session because of constant traffic. However, if I go to a club session, I end up doing sessions that aren't specific to my distances and tend to be focused more towards swimming distances. I, clearly, he's a triathlete who's training for like 750 meters or 1500 meters, and yeah. he's going to join swimmers who are training for 50 meters or 100 meters or maybe 200 meters, and he's feeling like it's not specific enough. Um, I would say that the answer is probably a mixture of both, but if you had to choose one or the other, go to the squad. That would be my... It is a little bit of a case-by-case. Case. Um, 
Are you someone that can go to a swimming pool, public swim session on your own and push yourself and get a lot out of it? Um, do you have a swimming pool where the public lane swimming actually allows you to do that well? Because some of them, particularly here doesn't in the UK, sound like it, does, it no. is chaotic. It doesn't sound like you do. Um, but even then, I would still say, as James uh, is, is suggesting, that actually going and joining a squad where you're going to get pushed by others, yes, they may be swimmers focusing on 50 meters 100 meters maybe even other strokes at times you're still going to gain a lot from swimming with them being pushed by them maybe even having a coach on poolside that's going to give you technical feedback um, you're going to gain a lot from that and when they do maybe go off start doing butterfly and some then just you know, go and do your front crawl focus on what's specific to you as a triathlete and then for that other 20 percent if you're swimming you can do that solo really focused on maybe the longer distance efforts that you require as a triathlete and you'll get a lot from that and the thing is don't focus too much on the distance just because you train for a 750 meter race or a 1500 meter race doesn't mean you need to do 750 meter yeah. reps or 1500 meter reps swimming is a technique sport which means you could build your technique to a really good level for a 1500 meter race and never swim more than 50 meters at a time without a break like you can do 50 meter repeats and you'll build your technique more than if you just swam 1500 meters so those swim squads where they seem like it's really broken up into itty little bits the whole way through in that squad is still going to make you a better swimmer when it comes to that 1500 meter straight swim it doesn't need to be long continuous reps all the time because you're training for a long continuous triathlon swim yeah all right last one uh quickly from torbend um he says what is the best strategy for coping with mental stress in the water basically it's safe especially when you're wearing a wetsuit but what if your brain is playing games too little air too many people around you etc ah, this is this is really common yeah open water anxiety everyone gets it yeah. so uh, it is very common uh it's not a natural environment and in a race environment or an open water environment, it's even more so. There are so many kind of strange things. There's so much external stimulus all at the same time. You've got the cold water, you've got the tight wetsuit, you've got your face in the water, you've got murky water, you've got splashes from other people, you've got the sun in your eyes, maybe you've got the wind, you've got the chop. There are so many things that are new that you kind of just get this overwhelming anxiety. Mm -hmm. You are overwhelmed by all the stimulus that comes in. And the best way to deal with this, bar none, if you're a triathlete, is to make sure that as many of those things, those new stimulus, are not new on race day. And that means experiencing them beforehand. So getting into the water with your goggles on and your wetsuit on, not necessarily swimming hard, but just being in the water, being in that place, being in that environment where you can only see a certain distance, where you can't see around you, where people are splashing you, that kind of thing where you have that feeling of the cold water, the cold water on your face, etc., the murky water underneath. And just being in that environment doesn't need to be swimming at race pace, doesn't need to be all race simulation stuff, but just being in that environment so that you get comfortable in that environment and then there are less new stimulus so that on race day, the only thing new you have to deal with is the people around you. Everything else is familiar to you. And you'll find that anxiety goes way down and it doesn't feel nearly as stressful. Yeah, the other thing also on race day, just to add to that, is getting in the water a little bit before, even just lying on your back, getting accustomed to the temperature, um, the water going in your suit, various things like that, and then having a bit of a paddle around rather than just launching yourself into the water and frantically thrashing your arms around and then suddenly into the race. It can all just, uh, that your heart rate's gonna be elevated, just, ease in so. and another thing to be aware of is the actual wetsuit i know you say it's safer because you're in a wetsuit but a wetsuit is something that you need to get used to that is a, con a kind of tight feeling on your chest that takes some time to get used to it's a different feeling in the water and if you aren't used to it that tightness in your chest can feel like you're short of breath which leads to more anxiety and it's this this spiral where you suddenly are gasping and you can't catch your breath and you you do go into that anxiety spiral so make sure you well well used to your wetsuit spend as much time as you can before race day yeah. i hope that's helped answer your question and uh, all the other questions too if you have your own questions down below this video hashtag gtn coaches corner and we could be answering it next week thanks for watching